we want to start this morning, this exciting morning, in which we endeavor on a new phase of the anti-war movement by welcoming Claudia de la Cruz, who is the co-director of the People's Forum. <laughs> Claudia is a longtime community organizer from the South Bronx. If anyone wants to question credentials, you don't question the South Bronx. Welcome, Claudia. All right, y'all. Manolo gave me the, the green light. So money for, money for schools and education, not for war and acu. All right. You get, now that we all got this down packed, money for schools and education, not for war and occupation. So when my comrades and friends organizing the conference call, they said, we got to talk about demonization. And I was like, word. I got you. <laughs> and why did I say that? Because I think for us domestically, we could link and make the connections of what vilification and demonization look like. Like, just think about this. When black young people are killed and murdered by racist cops, we're never trained to ask about the racist state. We're always trained to ask, what were they doing? Right? When a woman is violently raped and raped again in the courts of this patriarchal system, we're never taught to question patriarchy. We're never taught to ask, why does this person, this male-bodied person, feel that they could do this to this woman? We're taught to ask what? What was she wearing? That was the first thing, folks, right? What was she, why was she out so late at night? Those are the things that we're talking If it's a trans person, why they want to dress like a girl, right? Those are the things that we're taught to ask. We have been trained to think in favor of the ruling class. They're systems of oppression. And raise questions that put blame, dehumanize, and destroy the character of those who experience brutality, the brutality of patriarchy, the brutality of capitalism, the brutality of white supremacy and imperialism. And so when we think about demonization, we don't have to go too far. It happens every day in our U.S. context. And so we should be able to make the connections with our comrades, friends, family, siblings across the seas. The tactic of vilifying the enemy and manufacturing public consent, like Manolo was talking about, to unleash violence and establish dominance has been utilized for centuries by the ruling class. They have used their systems and structures. And so through education or miseducation, the church, which happens to be very moral more, more, than, more often than not, the corporate media, culture, Wakanda forever. <laughs> talk about that later, um, continuously tries to shape public opinion and move the masses towards justifying and supporting wars that impact our lives and the lives of the working class people globally. We're not taught to ask, why are these our enemies? In whose interest are they labeled as such? Who benefits from these attacks? Who is let off the hook? Who creates the conditions for such brutality? Those are not the questions that we're taught to ask. If we were to be critical and we were to understand that the ones who have always benefited are the global capitalist forces and U.S. imperialism, they use our resources. They launch invasions, wars, while the majority of the world's population suffers the consequences. We put the bodies. We mourn the bodies. Mother Earth continues to suffer because they lie, because they justify, and because they train us to say, do what you must. 
Since, the, since 1980, the U.S. has been in at least 15 overseas attacks, 15 overseas wars. Its military has bases in 85 countries. Who is the empire when they're talking about Russia trying to reestablish the empire? For real, dude. Who is the empire? Who is the perpetrator of violence? The U.S. controls the economy of countries and it suffocates those nations and states that want sovereignty and self-determination. And how do they do it? Through U.S. sanctions. Who sanctions the U.S.? Who calls them terrorists? Who brings them up to international courts? The U.S. is the biggest perpetrator of war and brutality. So I got to give a shout out to the haters, because that's what the Bronx do. Um, TPF and the Anti Coalition called for this conference. Amazing, by the way. You all look very great. Give yourselves a round of applause. We're the courageous ones. And I would dare to say, you know, like, I would dare to say that we made the right people upset. Um, shout out to the five people outside. We are clear, we must not be lukewarm in our positions. I will say that again, we must not be lukewarm in our positions. We don't have to be Russians, and we don't have to be Ukrainian to say that the U.S. war machine needs to stop. We don't have to be Ukrainian, we don't have to be Russians, in the same way that you don't have to be part of the LGBTQ community to defend their rights. In the same way that you don't got to be black and brown to be anti-white supremacist. Those are not prerequisites to stand for justice. In fact, it is our responsibility to demand that the U.S. stops instigating and escalating in this conflict. It is our responsibility to demand that the U.S. stand down and instead of instigating and provoking and fueling war, takes the routes of no negotiations. We have the responsibility to demand that the U.S. stops the spread of NATO in that region. Actually, we have the right and responsibility to ask for the shutdown of that war machine. We have the responsibility to say, shut down NATO, shut down Africa, and shut out every instrument of war that you have across the globe. Not on our name. We don't have to be anything, anything else but conscious people committed to peace with justice, wanting humanity and the earth to be saved from catastrophe, hunger, and devastation to demand that the U.S. government stop its brutality against the rest of the world. And we need to be clear about that. So when people say, you aren't a Ukrainian, you ain't Russian, the answer is going to be, but I am goddamn human. The U.S. government administration and the Pentagon have historically created disastrous conditions and provoked conflicts all over the world. Nancy Pelosi. I would say God bless her heart, but that's not really how I feel. <laughs> you remember, I mean, it just happened recently. Um, the U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi goes to Taiwan. China's like, don't come. Do you go to anybody else's house, like, uninvited? Because if you do, you deserve to be reprimanded. Russia, like, China said, don't come. What does she do? She goes. And the rest of the G7 ministers are like, bet. And actually, China, you overreacting, bruh. You are overreacting. So you violate our space. You do not respect the lines. People talk about boundaries all the time these days. You don't respect the boundaries. And we overreact? That's the U.S. for you. The U.S. narrative about Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine war, you know, unprovoked 
attacked by Putin. That's the narrative. But how much of that is a fact? Who is solidifying its empire at the expense of the people of the world if it's not the US? We have a collective responsibility. And now I'm going to go into my theologian. Like, can I do that? Theologian side? All right. We have a collective responsibility. I'm going to say that again because I like it. We have a collective responsibility. Familia. Can I quote you, PJ? Yeah, for sure. All right. So I remember <laughs> it's the gospel according to VJ. Dismemberment. You talked about dismemberment. The dismemberment of our collective consciousness, the dismemberment of our bodies, the dismemberment of our history. We have a collective responsibility to remember. To remember, you like the mix, right? I mixed it up. <laughs> we have a collective responsibility to remember. Let's remember how things really went down and how we got here. So I'll share some stuff. The U.S. pushed four waves of NATO expansion in that territory. In 1999, incorporating three Central European countries. In 2004, incorporating seven more. In 2008, committing to enlarge the Ukraine and Georgia, and in 2022, inviting four Asia Pacific leaders to NATO. And their aim was China, and their aim continues to be China. So let's not get it twisted. Those are facts. Let's remember that the US fails to mention its role in the 2014 Ukraine coup. So, you create the conditions to unleash chaos, and then you want to sell us the recipe to fix it? We have the collective responsibility to remember, to wake up from this collective amnesia that the ruling class enforces upon us viciously, spreading lies, fear, and hate. We have the collective responsibility to remember all the interventions in this American continent and whose hands were behind it. When we talk about the tactics of manufacturing consent, we got to talk about demonization, but that creation of the axis of evil, those external and eternal enemies, the terrorists, those are the words, those are the labels, then portraying themselves as the rightful keepers of the world order and democracy. They must put all of their resources to fight these evil people, evil nations, while depriving their people of what they need. Remember Panama? Remember Panama? Noriega. He was a CIA agent. He worked really closely with the CIA. He went to the School of the Americas, the School of Assassins, that developed a whole lot of the military dictators in the region. But he was good for the US. And then he wasn't. And then when he wasn't, Daddy Bush said, we got to save. We got we to gotta save Panama. That's what he said. And how did he think it was a good idea to save Panama? By launching a damn invasion. So once you're not useful to me and my interest, I'm going to unleash the wrath of hell onto your people. And it's going to be a collective punishment. And that's what happened in Panama. And what was the justification? He's a drug lord. He's a criminal. While at the same time financing dictatorships and the persecution of activists and organizers all throughout Central America. Let us remember that in El Salvador and Guatemala, there were hundreds of thousands of people 
who were murdered. And the U.S. had its hands in it. The height of U.S. hypocrisy. Remember Yugoslavia? I'm not going to say how old I am, but I remember. <laughs> I remember. The forces collaborating with NATO and imperialism demonized Yugoslav leader Ms. Uh, Milosevic. NATO waged a 10-year war on Yugoslavia, wanting to regain hege hegemony. What did that mean for the people? Can you remember Kosovo? You remember that? It was, it was 78 days of terror, of violence, of bombs dropping, of kids dying. Because they make it sound like, you know, oh, you know, we had this shit happen and, you know, brush it off, let's go to the weather type of news. People died from both sides. And the U.S. had its hands in that. Their propaganda offensive obscured the interference, subversion, and divide and conquer tactics that were practiced by the U.S. imperialists. And similar demonization campaigns have been launched against Gaddafi in Libya, Magube in Zimbabwe, Fidel Castro in Cuba, long live the socialist revolution of Cuba, The same thing happened with Chavez and now Maduro, and long live the socialist project of the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela. <laughs> Leaders of whichever country the U.S. aims to crush and do not bend their knee to the empire are a threat. Not because they're materially a threat, but because ideological, ideologically, they offer a new path. Whether we agree or not, that's besides the point. But the idea of the United States is to crush opposition domestically and externally. And then what type of democracy are you talking about? So comrades, friends, family, we have a collective responsibility. Say, we have, say with me, join me in this. We have a collective responsibility to remember. And we have a collective responsibility to not stand by passively. Let us not be standbyers and watch these so-called leaders who don't lead shit and who don't represent anyone in this room or anyone in this country take us to hell time after time. Let us not stand by while they do this. They have showed us they are the ones who place more money into militarism and war than the basic needs of its citizens. Our struggle for peace, for justice, for liberation, self-determination is one. Our demands for the most basic human needs and rights are righteous. Are righteous. And they're, they shouldn't only be our demands domestically. They should be our demands internationally because it is about human rights. How does any government commit over $10 billion to war in Ukraine when none of these people have done anything to me. You're in the worst recession since the 1980s. How do they commit to strengthening their military budget while there are 150 million people in the U.S. living in poverty? How can they speak to justice when people can't afford to live in this country? How? Who is the actual threat to the U.S.? And people, working class people, who is the threat? And who is the threat for the rest of the world? Say it with me. We have a collective responsibility to remember and to build. To build. To build an anti-war movement that is courageously and boldly anti-imperialist. It can't be a whitewash, let's have peace, we love everybody type shit, no. There are people who don't deserve to be loved. The U.S. and its war machine don't deserve no love from me. So we need to be clear about that. We must oppose this path of terror, of brutality, of violence, of imperialism, 
at home and abroad. Mother Earth and humanity is at stake. So what do we have? We have a? To remember and to build. Amen to that. For those in my generation, Brian Becker's name is synonymous with the mobilizations of millions in the United States against imperialist war. That's why we are beyond honored to have him not just speak, but to welcome him to be a teacher today, to give us context, to give us history, to give us insight, not just into why this war is wrong, but ultimately why and how we will act against it. Welcome, Brian Becker. Thank you, Manolo. And thank you to all of the other speakers. And we have two great speakers following me coming up. Eugene Perrier and Vijay Prashan. And I know Eugene is just back from the South, where a new union of Southern service workers and other low paid workers was formed this weekend to take the fight against the billionaires. I also want to thank those who have come a longer distance. We have friends and comrades from Boston, Washington, D.C., uh, Philadelphia. I, there's many other cities who are here. They're here to be part of the demonstration. To be part, I called it a demonstration. Well, it is a demonstration to be part of this meeting and also to secure this meeting. You notice that we have people with security vests outside. Because guess what? When we announced that there was going to be a meeting with a very, let me, when we were going to have a meeting with a very mild title, the path to peace in Ukraine, it wasn't like death to U.S. imperialism. It wasn't turn your guns around and turn the imperialist war into a revolutionary war. Our, it, there were none of, those, none of those kind of radical slogans. We had a slogan that said, the path to peace, negotiate, don't escalate. And as soon as we said that, all of the war makers, including the Zelensky government apparently, and the right wing of the Democrats and the Republicans, and of course, the capitalist media, which is, you can't get more warlike than the mainstream media, liberal and conservative alike, they all started attacking this meeting as if some terrible event was gonna take place in Midtown Manhattan because we called for peace in Ukraine. You don't have to have a very radical slogan to draw the wrath of the war makers because in fact, whenever people have organized and fought for and mobilized for peace, they do draw the wrath of the war makers. And it doesn't matter whether their slogans are soft and mild, whether they talk about negotiations or overturning capitalism, just mobilizing the people against war is a great danger to the war makers because if the people finally say no to war, the wars end. The ruling class can't do the wars without the people. I mean, just remember when Eugene Debs opposed the US entrance into the World War I in 1917, he made a speech against the war. He said, let's not go and kill other workers in other countries. He said, the only war I'll be in is a class war against the bosses.
again, that was a little bit more of a radical slogan. But because he was against the U.S. entrance in World War I, he was put on trial, he was convicted, and at age 66, he was sent to prison for 10 years at hard labor. And when he was in his jail cell, he ran for president and got a million votes from people who stood with him. This coming year will mark another anniversary, not only of Martin Luther King's birth, but his death. April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King assassinated in Memphis while standing with sanitation workers. His assassination came one day to the, one year to the day that he stood at a podium in Riverside Church on April 4th, 1967, and he said, the government of the United States, my government, is the greatest purveyor of violence on the planet, and we have to stand with the Vietnamese people and demand that they have a right to self-determination. And one year later, he was shot dead because the war makers don't want the people to talk about peace. And for Dr. King to courageously come out against the war in Vietnam meant that he would have been the leader of a new anti-war movement in the United States, drawing together the black community and the Puerto Rican and Latino community and the millions of whites who were already protesting against the uh, Vietnam War it would have been a rainbow, multiracial, multinational coalition for peace. And that's why Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated one year to the day after he announced his opposition to Vietnam. And then the year later, a young man, 21 years old, one of the great leaders of all time in the U.S. social justice movement, the chairman of the Black Panther Party, Fred Hampton. Who is known as a leader of the Black Panther Party. Fred Hampton was also the leader of a multiracial, multinational peace movement against the war in Vietnam and in solidarity with the Vietnamese people and their right to determine their own destiny. And he was shot dead by the Chicago police and the FBI, December 4th, 1969. So when we see that our meeting under this very mild slogan, the path to peace in Ukraine, elicits all of this hostility and opposition, remember it's not simply because Russia was the one that invaded on February 24th, 2022. The U.S. war makers will always oppose those who are advocating for peace, whether it's in Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya or Panama, it doesn't matter. If you stand for peace and against the war makers, you, you represent an existential threat. An existential threat. Because if we win the people over, the war makers can't have the war. It's that simple. They don't fight their own wars. They get the working class to fight. They get the poor to fight. If the billionaires in the 1%, the bourgeoisie, had to actually fight imperialist wars, the wars would end, they would have ended a long time ago. They're only content with endless war and full spectrum dominance. If we agree to send our children to fight and die under the slogans that the imperialists provide us, and every time they go to war, they always give it a noble cause. It's not the 19th century or even the early part of the 20th century where the U.S. could invade Haiti and march the Marines into Port-au-Prince and take all of the money back to New York City banks and, and do it just because they could. Nowadays, with modern sensibilities, they have to give the invasions a noble cause, not theft and plunder and pillage, it's for something good. 
In the case of Iraq, it was to save us from weapons of mass destruction. In the case of the bombing of Libya, it was to help protect civilians. In the case of the bombing of Yugoslav, Yugoslavia in 1999, it was to help Muslims in Kosovo, as if American imperialism suddenly started to love Muslims. And now the endless war in Ukraine, which is what they want, it's to stop Russia and to save Ukrainians. And the war makers love Ukrainians suddenly. We're taught to love Ukrainians and care about them. And why? Because if U.S. imperialism had to send U.S. kids to go and fight Russians, there would be a, a movement of hundreds of thousands or millions of Americans against this war with Russia. But if the U.S. can have Ukrainians do all the dying, have them do all the bleeding, have all the suffering somewhere else, then we can continue, as George W. Bush said, to keep shopping, not think about it, not be worried about it, not to be too angry about it, and simply accept the demonizing, colorful demonizing rhetoric against the enemy, in this case, Russia and Vladimir Putin. We have to stand up to the war because, as Noam Chomsky put it, I can't believe Noam Chomsky is not reading from a script. He's just that wise, that articulate, even as an elder who has been there for so many decades, he can say, this is a ghastly gambit. And it is. And, you know, you think about who's engaging in the ghastly gambit. People like Anthony Blinken, who spent their entire lives going to private schools, whose father was a cold warrior. People who are so privileged, so rich, who have never suffered at all. For them, all of this is just a, a big geostrategic chessboard where other people are the pawns and other people are dying. And they don't give a damn. They truly don't give a damn. In October 2021, Anthony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Joe Biden, they must have woken him up for the meeting. They, 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 had, a, they had a strategic session, and Biden was told that the Russians were preparing to invade Ukraine. And Biden said, really? I'm serious. This is a Washington Post account of the meeting based on people who were in it. So said, really? And they were like, yeah. And he turned to William Burns, who was CIA director, and he said, are they going to really invade? Yeah, yeah, they're going to do it. I'm, I think they're serious. Jake Sullivan, yeah, yeah, they're going to do it. And then publicly, they started to announce that the Russians were going to invade. Remember? I mean, on, on our podcast, we thought, no, the Russians aren't going to invade. We thought, no, that's just more imperial war propaganda. And the Russians said, no, they're not going to invade. But Anthony Blinken kept saying, yeah, they're going to invade. They're definitely going to invade. And during that entire time where the U.S. was predicting the invasion of Russia, how did the U.S. react to the, what they said was the coming invasion? They continued to insist. They continue to insist that all of Russia's demands to not have Ukraine become a staging ground for advanced U.S. nuclear and conventional missiles, missiles that could reach their target in five minutes, meaning missiles that Russia could not defend against. When Russia said, you will not be allowed to bring your missiles to our border because we will never have a day of peace from now on. Blinken, Blinken, Blinken said those demands are non-starters. So they predicting the invasion of Russia. Russia says, look, we're really serious. This is a red line. We're amassing troops. You better negotiate. And instead of negotiating, Blinken and the Biden administration said, you don't tell us who can join NATO. And you don't tell Ukraine whether they can be in NATO or not. You, Russia, have no right to do this. And so 
for months. Not only did they do that, they pumped in another $10 billion of weapons at the same time. So Putin is being told, we're never going to negotiate. We are going to put the advanced weapons on your border. We know you can't defend against them. And basically, F you. Right? That was the message. Why? If they knew the invasion was coming, and they knew it would be horrible, and thousands of people would die, why didn't they say to the Russians, okay, let's meet. Let's seriously meet. Let's talk about this. Maybe Ukraine could be neutral. Maybe it doesn't need advanced weapons that have a flight time of five minutes pointing at Moscow on your border. Maybe we can meet you halfway. Now, is that a reasonable, would that have been a reasonable position? Would that have been reasonable? I mean, think about when the Soviet Union slash Russia put missiles in Cuba in 1962. The United States said to Cuba and to Russia, we are going to have a thermonuclear war unless you take those missiles out of Cuba. They were 90 miles away from the United States. I was a young kid. We all anticipated that there would be a thermonuclear war because we thought the Pentagon's going to definitely do it and the Russians aren't going to back down. But the Russians did back down. The Soviets did back down. Thankfully, the Soviets backed down because if they hadn't, we wouldn't be meeting here today. There would have been a thermonuclear war. And the madmen, the lunatics in the Pentagon were prepared to do that. But now they're doing the same thing to Russia. And Russia says, look, we have red lines. Don't cross these red lines. We mean it. This is serious. And they did it anyway. They said no. Again, why? Because they wanted this war. Lincoln wanted the war. Biden wanted, well, Biden was informed that he wanted the war. And then he said, attaboy. They wanted the war because the war accomplishes some really important political, military, and economic objectives for U.S. imperialism. What are they? Number one, Europe was becoming independent of U.S. imperialism, and Germany and France and Italy actually want better relations with Russia, which means that they end their dependency on the U.S., which began at the end of World War II when all of those countries lay in ruins because of the magnitude of violence in World War II. The new world order that the U.S. created in 1945 said to Italy, Germany, and Japan, the defeated enemies of the U.S., you're now our friends. You can come in. We're not going to treat you as Germany was treated at the end of World War I with heavy sanctions in Versailles. We're going to bring you into the world economy. We're going to give you access to the world market. We're going to let you, the German, Japanese, and Italian bourgeoisie, get rich again. We're not going to humble you and defeat you. But in exchange, you're going to be the junior partners of our government in its war against revolutions in Asia and its war against socialism in Africa and socialism in the Middle East and socialism in Asia, too. You will be junior partners, and you will be under our leadership, our domination. That was the unipolar world that the U.S. anticipated at the end of World War II. The U.S. created the U.N., the World Bank, the IMF, and at Bretton Woods made the dollar the world reserve currency a great privilege. All the other countries had to buy dollars. The U.S. could just print them. So the U.S. was creating a unipolar world and all of Europe was fastened, as was Japan, under the domination of US, the US hegemon. What the US didn't expect in 1945 was that the Soviet Union would no longer be the sole socialist country because revolution spread to China and Korea and Vietnam and Indonesia and India and the Middle East that this revolutionary wave led to the creation of new socialist governments and that the Red Army, which had liberated Europe from Nazism in Eastern and Central Europe, 
also facilitated the creation of new socialist states in that part of the world. So suddenly, the U.S. plans for a unipolar world were trashed because what emerged was a bipolar world, two camps, the socialist camp led by communist parties and the capitalist camp led by U.S. capitalism saw each other as rivals, challenged each other for uh, support and, and, and uh, attention in other parts of the world. What we now call the Cold War, which was really a global class war between the workers and poor peasants led by communists against capitalists everywhere. So the world divided in this bipolar fashion until the Soviet Union was overthrown and the socialist governments were vanquished in Eastern and Central Europe. And then the U.S. said, now we can do what we wanted to do in 1945. Now we can actually have a unipolar world. Now we can say to the rest of the world, we will not allow or allow to emerge any rival, even a regional rival, like Iraq or Syria or Libya or Iran or Venezuela or Cuba. We won't allow any of them to exist. We are the global hegemon. This is, at last, the, the attainment of a unipolar world. And over the last 30 years, everything that we've seen in terms of U.S. policy has been designed to maintain, reinforce, and enforce that unipolar domination. But guess what happened? The U.S. went to war in Iraq because it was the unipolar power. And the Iraqis said, we don't give a damn what kind of power you think. We're not going to allow foreign troops to occupy our country without fighting you, resisting, and ultimately driving you from our country. And the Iraqi resistance bogged U.S. imperialism down. The same thing happened all over the place. The U.S. couldn't actually maintain unipolar power like as if it was the 19th century because the people of Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America won't go back. They're not going back to the 19th century. They're going to fight. They're going to resist. And they're going to win. So while the U.S. is bogged down trying to recolonize the so-called third world, China grew strong. Russia got back on its feet. As a major power, both of them, big countries, big populations, lots of natural resources, well-educated populations, big military energy and oil supplies. Suddenly, even though China and Russia did not want to be the rival of U.S. imperialism, China kept saying, no, let's have win-win. We'll grow and you can still rule the rest of the world, just not us. That was China's kind of appeasement policy for 15 years. Libya, fine, we're going to abstain, but don't make it about us. Russia also wanted to be friends with American imperialism. Putin was even invited as a dinner guest to the G8 meetings, as long as they basically allowed the U.S. to be the unchallenged hegemon in the world. But then the U.S. can't stop itself. The organic trend towards counter-revolution and the decision to smash or weaken Russia and China because they were major powers and they were independent powers and they weren't going to be subjugated as colonies by the U.S., the U.S. decided, okay, we're going to go to war. And so U.S. has refashioned its military strategy. It's called major power conflict. And it became the priority of the Pentagon in its 2018 quadrennial report. And so Russia and China are thinking like, okay, the most powerful military in the world, the U.S., is preparing to go to war against us. What should we do? If you're Russia, what should you do? You know the U.S. is now reorienting contingency planning, budgeting, uh, ripping up arms treaties to get ready for the coming war with our country. You're Russia. And now you see that they're going to take Ukraine, which was the second biggest republic in the Soviet Union, historically, culturally, linguistically tied to Russia. They're going to incorporate Ukraine into, the, into NATO after a Nazi-led, U.S.-backed Nazi-led coup. And what are you going to do if you're Russia? Are you going to say, okay, fine? No, 
It wouldn't matter if it was Putin or any other political leader. It's untenable for the Russians to allow this to happen. This is what the U.S. plan was. The Russians knew it. Unfortunately, the Russians invaded Ukraine. Are we for that? We didn't think, we didn't think that was great. We thought that only unites the imperialists under the U.S. All of the opposition in Europe got muffled. It snuffed out the, 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 the left-leaning and left-moving contradictions within Europe and put Europe really into a vassal state under the domination of U.S. imperialism. Lenin, Stalin, Brezhnev, didn't matter who the Soviet leader was. If you look at Soviet foreign policy, that policy was always designed to not allow the imperialists to unite at once against the Soviet Union because they would be too strong. By the invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the Russian government allowed all of the imperialists to be united at one, as one under the leadership of the U.S. So we have this terrible tragedy. Europe is more connected to U.S. imperialist domination. Thousands of Ukrainians and Russians are dying. A people, the Ukrainian and, and, and Russian people were one people when they were the Soviet Union. You don't have to go to the 10th century as Putin does in his speeches about the historical unity of Ukrainians and Russians. The Soviet Union existed from 1922 to 1991, and there was never a war between Ukrainians and Russians. They fought together and defeated fascism and imperialism. I mean, this is a, this is a terrible terrible tragedy. But for us in the United States, in the belly of the beast, in U.S., living in U.S. under the leadership of U.S. imperialism, a government that says it speaks for us, do we then sit back and say, oh, the Russians pulled the trigger on February 22nd, uh, uh, 24th, 2022. The Russians are the aggressors and ignore all of this other history, ignore what actually has been happening. Ignore the fact that U.S. imperialism wanted the war, obviously, as we could see, because they refused to negotiate in good faith when Russia said, this is it. They refused to because they wanted the war. And we have to say, as people living in the United States, that our enemies are really not in Moscow. They're not in Kiev. They're not in, in any other place. They're on Wall Street. They're in Washington. They're at Langley Air Base. They're at the Pentagon. So we want the war to end. We picked a mild slogan. The path to peace in Ukraine. Our point in all of this is that the path to peace is really quite simple once you know what the path to war was. The path to war was the refusal by the Biden administration to negotiate over completely legitimate national security concerns of the Russian government. The real thing the U.S. could have easily done that would have saved Ukrainian lives was to say, yeah, Ukraine's not going to be part of NATO. Ukraine's not going to be a staging ground for advanced missiles that target Russia. The simple thing that they could have done to save Ukrainians they didn't do because they didn't give a damn about Ukrainians. So the path to peace isn't really through Moscow or Kiev. The path to peace is through Washington because it's their policies that made this war almost inevitable. I want to, I had, because I got carried away, I forgot one thing that I wanted to do early in the speech, but I want to do what I want to use. A, a video clip. It's about three minutes long. Victoria Newland, some of you will undoubtedly know about this. Victoria Newland, who was at this time in 2014 Assistant Secretary of State, had been Hillary Clinton's press spokesperson at the State Department when she became Secretary of State. She's a real neocon. Her whole family's neocon. She was in Ukraine in 2014 when the protests were going against Yanukovych. Who is Yanukovych? Was he corrupt? Undoubtedly. Was he elected? Yes. 
uh, was he uh, anti-EU? No, he wanted to have good relations with Russia and with the West. He wanted to be neutral. And he said the Ukraine would not come into NATO. And so Victoria Newland and the US, John McCain was all of them. They were in Maidan in the protest, handing out cookies. You know, they love street protests. That's why we always see them in Times Square. And, you know, whenever we're, you know, like having a militant protest, you can always count on high State Department officials to come and give us cookies. You know how that works. They were actually in Maidan giving out cookies, but when they weren't in the square giving out cookies, they were figuring out who the next government was going to be in Ukraine, and they were going to make sure Yanukovych, the neutral government, was gone and that the U.S. would have a puppet regime that would bring Ukraine into NATO, again, making the war nearly inevitable. So let's watch this clip. It's Victoria Nuland talking to the U.S. ambassador at that time in Kiev, at the time that the protests were going on. Listen to what she's saying. She's saying, this is right before the coup, which was February 22nd, 2014. She's saying, we're going to tell you who the government is, who the new government will be. Matter of fact, they're handpicking who the Ukrainian government was. And guess what? A month later, that was the Ukrainian government. Let's watch this. Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here, um, especially the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now. So we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yacht. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think what in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I, I, kinda... I, I, just, I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk, it's just not going to work. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? My understanding from that call, but you tell me, was that the big three were going into their own meeting and that Yats was going to offer in that context a three-way, you know, the three plus one conversation or three plus two with you. Is that not how you understood it? No, I think, I mean, that's what he proposed, but I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them where um, Klitschko has been the top dog, he's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got. He's probably talking to his guys at this point. So I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three, and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind it, behind it before they all sit down and he, um, he explains why he doesn't like it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he wants to talk before or after? Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay, I've now written, oh, one more wrinkle for you, Jeff. Yeah. I uh, can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He's now gotten both Sari and Ban Ki Moon to agree that Sari could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, f the EU. No, exactly. And I think we've got it. Sorry, you all had to hear her say, fuck the EU. But we kept it in because it kind of, we bleeped it for our radio show, but it kind of gives you a sense of what's really happening. Who's really the dominant power? Cleach is one of the people there. Um, 
Yats was Yatsenyuk, who became indeed the prime minister a month later. Uh, and Tony Brook was the Nazi. And she wanted to keep him out. She said, they can meet four times a week, but we'll keep the Nazi out because it's better to keep the Nazis not like be the prime minister. They could just meet four times a week. That's better. But here it is. It's the U.S. I mean, remember again, everybody, and I'm going to end on this. Ukraine was the second biggest republic in the Soviet Union, historically connected to Russia. And now the U.S. is overthrowing a democratically elected government and putting in a new right-wing government that declared war against the, the Russian-speaking people in the eastern part of the country. Apparently, the U.S. doesn't care about them. 14,000 of them died after this coup in the next eight years. They did all of that. And then when Russia said, look, this is unacceptable, they said, your demand for negotiations are a non-starter. So when we go forward, and we're going to announce here some other anti-war activities, when we realize that the U.S. government refused to negotiate, it's only because they wanted the war. They want us to be silent about the war. They're threatening people who even have mild slogans like the path to peace with violent and physical assaults and demonization. When we, when we see that the U.S. government is responding like this, that means we're on the right track because we have to be able to organize the millions of people, tens of millions. Some of them vote Democrat, some of them vote Republican. Most of them don't vote at all because they're so sick and tired of the system and don't believe in it. But we don't care about any of that. If you're a worker, if you're a young person, if you're somebody who is part of the working class, and suffering as everyone is suffering right now because of a billionaire-induced economic recession, then we should unite together to fight against the war makers, fight against imperialism, and say that we have more in common with the people in Ukraine and in Russia and everywhere else in the world than we do with the American bosses on Wall Street or in the CIA or the Pentagon. We are building a worldwide movement. Thank you.